Welcome to Tramlines, a podcast from Agri. I'm your host, Tony Smith, putting your questions to the experts. In this episode, we're talking to Amy Watkins, Agri's Sustainability Manager, Nathan Lewis, Riser's Business Development Manager, and Tom Perrett, Crop Input Specialist. We are here at Lama 2023 at the NEC near Birmingham on Agri's exhibition stand, where the theme is Understanding Your Soils. But what does understanding your soils really mean? And why is that so important? Uh, So good morning to you all. Good morning, Tony. Morning, Tony. Morning, Tony. So the theme of your stand is understanding your soils. So what does that really mean? Amy, let's let's talk to you first. Um, So really it's tied to things like net zero, uh, improving your nutrient use efficiency, also how you manage your cultivations, crop inputs as an example, and and soil is really at the main focal point of that. So hence why today our theme is around trying to understand your soils better to make those management decisions to try and help you become more sustainable. Uh, Tom, why is understanding your soils so integral to crop production? Well, there's an old saying, Tony, that you you start off with a good foundation, the rest will come true. And you know, that applies very well to agriculture. And if you can get your soils set up properly, you're gonna get more out of your nutrition, get more out of your nutrition, you run a more efficient business, run a more efficient business. The theory is you should get more in the shed at the end of the day. Fantastic, and that's what you know, farmers want to see, isn't it? More in the shed at the end of the day, I like it. And uh, Nathan, you know, from a riser perspective, um, how do you fit in with understanding your soils and what you do? So from our point of view, we are looking at the soil in, in a, a great depth, looking at soil type across the same field, different soil types, and then managing those areas depending on what inputs we need to put across the fields. Sure, so there's, there's a lot to be taking on board, isn't there? Now, Amy, I'd like you to talk us through the backdrop to the stand. So at the start of the stand, it really starts with your farm objectives. So it's important for us to understand as a business, what do you want to achieve out of anything that you're doing to your soils? So is it to improve your soil organic matter as an example, to improve drainage, to try and cut down your nitrogen, Um, These sort of aspects are really important before we make any management decisions on farm. We then move on to trying to understand the baseline data, so testing soils, whether that be digging holes in the field or just sampling as as an example, to understand what nutrients are there, what the physical characteristics are. Uh, And from that analysis then we start to see what's actually happening, what changes can we make to help you achieve those objectives. So moving right around to the other side, we've got things there like, you know, do we add organic matter uh, where, your, where your objective is to improve organic matter and improve carbon as an example, uh, putting roots into the ground to reduce soil erosion, um, or even just trying to improve your nitrogen use efficiency. So again, putting things like legumes in your cover crops to try and uh, reduce how much nitrogen you're putting onto the following crop. Okay, and, and you know, as sustainability manager, you're looking at Green Horizons as the, the initiative to take us through towards net zero. So if we understand our soils, Does that help us in trying to achieve net zero? Uh, Absolutely. I mean, talking about simply just carbon as an example, when we think about organic matter, that is one of the main uh, things that we measure to look at crop carbon sequestration in the soil. Uh, Then there's also things like nitrogen, which is probably contributing around 60% of the average arable farm production system for greenhouse gas emissions. But there's a lot that we can do to to manage that before we start thinking about cutting it. I mean, cutting it is probably the easiest thing to say, but it's really not that simple. There's things such as, you know, trying to enhance your nutrient use efficiency, using inhibitors as an example there as well. Uh, And this all ties back to reaching net zero, trying to look at how we can reduce our passes in the field by using products such as LiquiSafe, which I'm sure Tom will be able to talk more about as well, uh, and trying to improve your nutrient use efficiency. Yeah, it sounds very good and sounds like it it all fits together very very well Uh, Tom at what point do you start to look into what nutrients are required in a crop where does that start from your perspective well I think for me looking at this backdrop a lot of it starts with that farm objective you know what is it you want to achieve you know do you want to start looking at a more regenerative way of life you know what's your particular direction of your business Once you've ascertained that direction and and you understand how how you want to use the soils to benefit your end goal, then you can start to say, well, actually, part of that journey, I will then start to maybe look at not using as much ammonium nitrate. I might start to go and, say, use a protected urea. Or if you're in a liquid situation, you might use an inhibitor that you can put in with that. 
and you can then tailor the input to the crop to your farm objective. So it actually all just ties in and you know it always comes back to the soil. You know there are things that you can do to the soil to give it a bit of a jump start but there are short-term fixes not a long-term solution. So yeah quite a long way to go. Yeah, okay. And then Nathan, coming to you, I, I can see on, on, on the, uh, the wall there, precision mapping. How does precision mapping really help us achieve understanding your soils? So I guess from our point of view as Riser, we are the digital platform which is linking all that data into one place to make decisions easier for the likes of Amy and Tom and the agronomy teams. So our platform contour is the place, one place to go to, to capture all that data and then make decisions from that data source that we have available to us whether that's from yield maps from satellite imagery soil data analysis we can we can make decisions off of off the back of that that's fantastic now behind you there tom we've got three tubes so just uh, let, let's all have a look at these tubes here and and i'm <laughs> who's going to volunteer to explain what they are we've got three tubes here so for our listeners one's labeled horse manure one's labeled food waste and one's labeled grass cuttings so who's going to explain what this demonstration's about i can see you're all smiling going oh who's going to go first amy you've been volunteered so tell us what's this about so with this, we're trying to demonstrate the soil ecosystem and how soil biology really helps to break down things to make compost, to help um, make crop production more efficient as well. So if we're relating this particularly to cover crops as an example, um, of course, the different carbon to nitrogen ratios that you'd have in your cover crops would mean that they would break down quite uh, different rates as an example so we'd have things like brassicas which have quite high carbon rate rates in there which would break down a lot slower than something um, that has much more nitrogen in it and we've got these demos here which is showing you know we've got at the horse manure we've got straw at the top which is then broken down to compost right at the bottom and what's really breaking down that straw which has quite a high carbon content in is that fungi so the fungi is breaking down that straw which is then consumed by the worms and then eventually turned into compost and it usually takes about a year or so for that to happen but that depends on how much biology is in the soil now the food waste one's quite interesting we've got some pot worms at the top which aren't very commonly seen in most of our farmland soils they're more common in forestry soils uh, and that's because they like quite moist conditions uh, and also acidic scenarios but then at the bottom we've got our different types of earthworm species that we find in any farming system um, the anisic which are the deep burrowers then we've got the epigeic and the endogeic different types of worms uh, and those are basically consuming the bacteria and the fungi that are breaking down that that organic matter and then producing the compost that we have at the bottom very interesting indeed so um tom what, what do you notice in terms of difference between these three I think it's uh, interesting to look at the amount of worm activity in the farm waste, um, in the food waste, apologies, throughout the whole container. Um, but I think what I take away from it is the end goal of getting that composted material broken down is your end goal. It's the same in all three samples. And I think what's interesting from an agricultural point of view is understanding the time it takes to get to an end product that's usable for your soil profile. So we do a lot of talks where we're talking about how to better manage slurry, how to better manage your farmyard manure. You know, how can you speed up that process to get to that end composted goal quicker without losing nutrition to the atmosphere? So there's lots of different ways you can do it, but it's, it's that end goal that we want to achieve. Okay, so we're looking at these soil profiles. They do look quite different, but my question really is, is well, okay, that's great, but so what? What is that actually going to mean for the grower? I think the, the most important thing with worm activity is it's a very good indicator, baseline if you will, for soil health. And obviously the more worms you've got, one could suggest that that's a better soil profile, it's in a better place, it's got better bacteria and fungi levels. And if you've got all that set up correctly, that means you're going to get a better response from your crops to the inputs that you're applying to them. And I think that's just a really nice simple baseline for someone to go out and dig a hole, see where your compaction layer is take note of how many worms are around just a really good indicator very simple thing to do that perhaps you should be doing on farm anyway in terms of looking at your soil profiles so what we're looking at with these profiles is the addition of organic matter so is that readily accessible the horse manure food waste or is that limiting for some farms in some part of the some parts of the country 
I think there is a limitation of accessibility with you know organic waste, particularly when we're talking about livestock manures as an example. Um, things like digestate people tend to use quite a lot as well, but there are other ways of increasing the organic matter in your soils that doesn't involve the application of organic manures. So as an example, you could um, use cover crops in the rotation. Granted, it won't actually improve your organic matter levels quite as quickly as actually putting organic manures on in the first place, but it is certainly a way to actually start increasing your organic matter and prevent any losses occurring as well. Tom, I'm going to come back to you. What, what, what's the benefit? We can see the benefit in terms of that soil profile. I'm assuming that that will relate through to better crop performance. What are the other benefits? Well, one of the things you want to, you're aiming to try and achieve when you're applying this organic matter is you want to get more air into the soil profile. So it has the ability to be able to weather, you know, inclement weather events better. You know, we want a soil profile that will absorb and store water, but we still want to have air in there so that the plants can still access the nutrients that they need and still develop in a correct manner so we end up with a sort of satisfactory end result. You know, it, it's, um, and you know, there are, going back to the question that you asked Amy, you know, there are lots of people now trying to do, you know, muck for straw deals. Um, and we often see, you know, manure being moved some quite distances and being paid for now. So, because there are lots of large arable units that are now seeing the benefits from applying organic manure to, you know, improve that soil health. So there's a lot to be had from understanding your soil and then putting some action into place to actually improve it, isn't there? How long can it take to realistically shift your soil in terms of improving the profile? Uh, how long could that take? Well, it's completely dependent on the soil type that you're on. Uh, if you're talking about, for example, quite a heavy clay soil, which is, tends to be self-structuring, so it does kind of do its own thing over time. but. Relating this back to something that everybody talks about, which is regenerative farming, you tend to start seeing those differences over a three to five year period. Um, we test for organic matter really every three to five years, like we do our standard nutrition tests as well. And you really wouldn't see much of a difference um, any shorter than that. If you wanted to try and look at any differences in a shorter time period, you'd start to look at the different pools of carbon in the soil. So instead of looking at the organic fraction, which is kind of a slow builder, you start to look at that active component, which is feeding the soil biology and changes a lot quicker than the organic component. Sure, and that mirrors what people were saying at Groundswell, where we uh, recorded a podcast uh, last year, and it was very much what farmers and growers were saying there was, you know, think about it as a five-year term before you start to see those real benefits. For five years, that's five crops, that time soon goes, doesn't it? <laughs> and you can start to see those benefits there. So Nathan, I'd like to bring you in here to, to understand a bit more clearly, when we're talking about understanding soils, how the precision services help us do that. So can you talk us through how, how what you do helps us understand the soils? So from the riser point of view, when we map the farm using our EC scanner, we're looking at different soil types across the field. So from that different soil type, we then soil analysis will give us the sand, silt and clay content of each individual area of the field, which we've picked out from the EC map. We then treat those areas variably, depending on what the analysis comes back for. Then we use our satellite imagery to look at the crop growth through the season and then apply the nitrogen accordingly to what we see in the ground truthing and through the imagery. And, and so in terms of understanding the soil, what's happening in the soil profile, give me some examples of what questions that's going to throw up for the agronomist and the farmer. So on the using uh, satellite imagery, if you've got a poor area of the field, we would use, or the agronomist would use that to go in ground truth and look at the poor area of the field and look at the good area of the field and then work out what's going on. It might be rabbit damage, it could be lack of seed and we need to up the seed rate. We, we're using it as a, a decisions tool. And, and when will that help the decisions, Tom? Well, I think it's something that happens throughout the entire year. I mean, I think what's, once you've implemented a, one of your farm objectives that we started this conversation off with, you basically start looking at how you can utilise the map. How is that crop responding to those changes that you've made throughout the season? So you're basically giving you some form of validation to a process that you've already done, and it then allows you to monitor any variable inputs you have the chances to make, so maybe variable nitrogen application, and then basically at the end of the season you can go back, review that data, and then the following season you start again at the beginning of our board where we started the conversation off with your farm objective. So what did I learn last year? How can I utilise the data set that I've now got from my imagery 
what did I do to the soil and what was my crop response and how can I use that to move forward? Really, I know, I think we know the answer, but understanding your soil, is that really a critical thing to be able to do? It absolutely is, without a doubt. And, and a lot of people think they understand everything about their soils because, you know, it's been in the family for generations. My grandfather, my great grandfather's been doing it, so on. Um, but there's still a lot to be learned and you can still learn a lot from, from your soils by doing different types of tests as an example. Yes, you can go and dig holes out in the field and the spade is probably the, one of the most important pieces of equipment on farm. But there's also things like texture analysis, which quite, it's quite amazing actually hearing how few people have had texture analysis done. But when people do have it done, it's really interesting to see, right, this is what my texture is, percentage of sand, silt and clay. So this is how I can then manage that. Because what, how you manage a sand will be very different to how you manage a clay. Then there's the organic matter testing, which is just as important as well to, to measure any changes that are being made in the soil, particularly when we talk about soil health that one's going to change whereas texture won't. So you've got to get a balance of measuring things that will change and won't change in the soil to make any changes going forward. Sure, and, and it's incredibly bespoke to that individual field and to that individual farm, isn't it? So Tom, in terms of bringing all that together, is the agronomist the key? Is the agronomist in terms of working with people like your good self, crop input specialists, is that the key? Help me understand where do farmers start with this? Well, I think it's very easy to be overwhelmed almost straight away. You know, this, the soil in its own right is an enormous topic. And it's, it's basically understanding what's critical to your business and what you have the ability to control as a business. So if you don't have access to muck, but you've got a mole drain around, well, actually, the first objective you could look at is maybe tackling drainage issues around the farm. So it's just about not being overwhelmed by this enormous subject area, but actually looking at small bite-sized chunks that you can change at any one given time, and then monitor that change, understand what that change has meant to your business, your yields, what's in that shed, how much margin you've made, and then the following year when you've got another set of objectives and you've learned a bit more from 12 months, then look at another little bite size and build on it as time goes on. Building on Amy's points there about building this soil health within the profile over a period of time, building on what Tom's talked about, which is actually starting with your plan for the farm and for those fields. Just, just help us understand how this digital flow of information helps the advisor, the agronomist, and helps the farmer. So from our point of view, we can look at the decisions we've made from be it variable seed, variable nitrogen, variable P and K. We can look at yield maps. We can gather all that data for backdate it, go for as many years as we got our data, then sit down and look at the individual fields to then see where we're at, what we've done right, what we've done wrong, and go into more depth if there's a lot of variability and we're not expecting it to be there from, from what we've done. That really makes sense, to, really, really makes sense to me, bringing that all together, having that visibility, if you like, in terms of what's happening. So to, to bring this podcast together, you know, what would be your top tip, Amy, and I'm going to ask all of you to take away, to think about from this time of the year going forward uh, in this cropping cycle to think about in terms of understanding your soils. What would be your top tip to listeners today, Amy? My top tip would be that you can't manage what you haven't measured. So it's really important to measure whatever you can on the farm to then make management decisions from that to work towards a more sustainable system. And that links beautifully to what Nathan was just saying about part of that understanding, isn't it? So Nathan, what would be your top tip to listeners today to take away about where they can start to take that understanding of soils forward. Uh, my top tip would be embrace technology and go with it because it's the future. So Tom, in terms of bringing all that together, what would be your top tip to, uh, to, to grow us today in terms of understanding your soils? I think it goes back to one of my previous comments, Tony. Don't be overwhelmed by the massive information that's out there. Talk to your neighbours, understand what they've done and maybe just look at one thing that you can affect change of. Well, thank you, Amy Watkins, Tom Perrett and Nathan Lewis for your time today. A fascinating discussion about understanding your soils better and the benefits that we can achieve as a result. That's it for this podcast, but do tune in again as we meet the experts throughout the season, exploring the many immediate and longer-term questions for growers and farmers in the UK. If you have any questions that you'd like us to ask the experts, email info at agri.co.uk. See you next time.